Frozen Planet 2. What's now on BBC iPlayer? On tonight's One Show, George Clooney and Julia Roberts tell Alex why they love working together. Plus, Spice Girl Melanie C and the stars of All Creatures Great and Small, Nicholas Ralph and Callum Woodhouse join us on the sofa. We'll see you at seven. <laughs>
Labour accused the government of having the wrong priorities in wanting to lift the cap on bankers' bonuses. The pound has been tumbling, interest rates are rising, some prices are soaring. Do you accept that despite your interventions, times are going to be tough for people this winter? We're facing incredibly tough economic times. I'm here in New York at the United Nations. We've had the invasion of Ukraine, which has pushed up energy prices. We're still seeing the after effects of COVID. And what is very important, as well as growing our economy, we're also protecting our economic security. The Conservatives won the last election with one Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, and are now led by another, chosen only by party members. So what will change? I will be my own Prime Minister, uh, and I wouldn't compare myself to any uh, predecessors, and the times we're in are different from the times predecessors have been in. Uh, we are entering a new era. It is a more insecure era, and what my government is about is about delivering for people, making sure that people have the jobs, the opportunities and the future that they can rely on. This afternoon, the Prime Minister met the French President Emmanuel Macron. Insecurity abroad, insecurity at home, a problem not unique to the UK. And the Prime Minister and President meeting in the last hour, welcoming what they called impressive advances by Ukrainian forces in the ongoing war. And certainly, as far as Liz Truss is concerned, in comparison with Boris Johnson, on the issue of Ukraine, she wants to be the continuity Prime Minister, saying that the government will match or exceed the amount spent on military aid in Ukraine next year, as was the number this year, 2.3 billion pounds. But make no mistake, beyond that, the difference between this Prime Minister and the previous one will be really stark. Firstly, stylistically, Liz Truss answers questions directly and it's uh, fair to say that wasn't always the experience interviewing her predecessor. And then there is this whole vision on the economy, trying to boost economic growth. And two big questions for Liz Truss. One, will it work? And secondly, will the methods used be sufficiently popular. Chris Mason, our political editor in New York. Thank you. Well, the focus for the government this week will be firmly on the cost of living and the economy with more big announcements to come. Our economics editor, Faisal Islam, is with me now. So what are we expecting? Well, it's back to business and it's an immediate early test of the Trust Administration's skills at economic management. And if they get it right, we should have a shorter recession, lower inflation. Uh, and if they get it wrong, it could be higher borrowing costs, interest rates. And although a lower peak of inflation, it could be around uh, for some time to come. So three big days. Uh, tomorrow we have the announcement of the business energy support package. Remember they were promised equivalent help to that offered to households. It really matters what the detail is there. You know, where does that help kick in in terms of the size of the business? Exactly how much help is there? There's plenty of businesses who just cannot handle these astronomical energy bills that are coming through. So that'll be really important to get the detail of that tomorrow. Then on Thursday, we have another decision from the Bank of England uh, where it's pretty inevit it's inevitable that interest rates will go up. Will they go up by the biggest amount in a single day that we've seen for 33 years? That's the question. Um, and, and will that be seen as a response to some of what the government is planning um, and the inflationary possible impact of that. Uh, and then on Friday, we will get that mini budget. They're going to get a fiscal statement. Uh, the government will get more detail on the energy package and detail of some significant uh, tax cuts too. But what we won't get is a forecast from the independent advisors of the government, the Office for Budget Responsibility. They said that they could have done a version of a forecast for the government to see where borrowing was going. We didn't get that. We are getting uh, some movement in markets that we can show you here uh, that the long term interest, uh, interest rates sort of effectively charged to governments and it's going up across the world. But for the UK, that's an 11 year high of 3.3%. That interest rate matters for mortgages and for business lending too. So a lot of moving parts, a big test for the government uh, till the end of the week. Thank you. Railway workers are resuming their strike action next month in their long-running dispute over pay, jobs and conditions. Two more strike dates have been announced by the Drivers' Union ASLEF on Saturday the 1st 
and Wednesday the 5th of October. The RMT union says its members at Network Rail and 14 train operators will also strike on October the 1st, meaning travel chaos for the start of the Conservative Party conference and for tens of thousands of people travelling to London for the London Marathon. Our transport correspondent Katie Austin is at London's Euston station. Katie. Well, that's right. Train strikes in recent months have already brought trains to a halt. There were more scheduled for this month, but they were called off following news of the Queen's death. Now it's been confirmed that 9,000 train drivers at 12 companies, uh, 12 train companies who are members of the Aslev Union will walk out on Saturday the 1st of October. That's the same day that more than 40,000 rail workers in the RMT Union who work for Network Rail and 14 train companies will also take part in strike action, uh, plus members at a couple of other train companies in separate disputes. It's understood the TSSA Union is, is uh, expected to join in strike action that day but they haven't publicly confirmed it. That looks set to be uh, the most disruptive day of strike action so far. I understand as little as 10% of normal services may be able to run with. That means 90% of course uh, will be effectively cancelled. Then on Wednesday the 5th of October there's another strike this time just by train drivers in the Aslev Union and the, uh, the 12 train companies affected by that will most likely be able to run very few services or none at all. So these two strike dates will bookend the Conservative Party conference and they will affect travel uh, for people taking the train to get to the London Marathon on the Sunday the 2nd of October because of the knock-on impact of the action on the Saturday. Why is this all happening? Well, the Aslev Union says a lot of train companies just haven't offered anything in terms of pay that will help members cope uh, with high inflation that we're seeing at the moment. And the RMT union says its dispute is over pay uh, and it's about working conditions and it's about job security. The rail industry, for its part, says employers do want to give a pay rise, but they say reforms or modernisations must be agreed uh, for that to be able to be affordable. And so far, uh, talks still haven't produced any breakthrough. Katie Austin with the latest there. Thank you. The inquest has opened into the death of a teenage girl who took her own life five years ago after being exposed to harmful content online. 14-year-old Molly Russell viewed large numbers of social media posts about depression, suicide and self-harm. Angus Crawford has been at the hearing in North London. A family wanting answers. Why did Molly die? And what part did social media play? Ahead of them, two weeks in court, hundreds of pages of evidence containing many thousands of images, some too distressing to broadcast. A bright, apparently happy teenager, Molly was just 14 when she took her own life. Mm. Going through her social media accounts, her oh, father Ian shame. discovered she was being bombarded with content about suicide, depression and self-harm on Instagram, Pinterest and other apps. This is an inquest, no one's on trial. The aim, to find out why a child ended her own life. But for the first time, executives from two social media companies will have to give evidence under oath about what they do to protect their young users online. It contains some material that I'm sure is going to be very upsetting. Ahead of them, a forensic look into Molly's use of social media. Ian, with his legal team, have already seen much of that evidence files full of it. There was just no let up for Molly. This is relentless. I remember my disbelief when I saw my lifeless youngest daughter. Over the years, Ian has become a high profile campaigner for internet safety. The corporate culture at these platforms needs to change. Addressing MPs. To be proactive rather than reactive. Even meeting Prince William. Hoping that his campaigning and what the coroner decides here will make social media a safer place for all young users. This is both an intensely private moment for the family, hoping to find answers, but also a very public inquiry into the impact of social media on young minds. And with the online safety bill making its way through Parliament, it's sure that this inquest will be closely watched at Westminster and at Silicon Valley. 
Tomorrow, the court can expect to hear from Ian Russell himself, delivering something called a pen portrait. That's an insight into the bright, happy teenager that he knew and loved. Angus, thank you. And if you've been affected by any of the issues raised in that report, you can find help and support from organisations listed at bbc.co.uk forward slash action line. Police in Leicester say arrests could go on for months after the violent scenes in the city on Saturday involving men from sections of the South Asian Muslim and Hindu communities. Nearly 50 people have already been arrested in the past few weeks since the problems began. Today, leaders from both faiths in Leicester have come together to appeal for calm. Our Midlands correspondent, Navtej Johal, reports. Look again, another one. The sight of a city being damaged. Not just its streets and property, but also its reputation. Leicester has prided itself on being a place where people from different backgrounds live peacefully side by side. On Saturday night, after weeks of incidents and arrests involving mainly young men from parts of the South Asian Hindu and Muslim communities, large-scale disorder broke out in the city. For the first time, it's left people living here feeling worried. Have you ever seen anything like what happened here on Saturday night before? Because well, to, Leicester... well, to be honest, no. No, this is very, very surprised, actually, to be honest. It's because just recently it happened, two weeks ago, three weeks ago started, you know. People around here are feeling scared? Yeah, people are scared. I live here 20 years and I've never seen here like this. Sikhs go, Gurdwaras, Hindus go, temples, the Muslims go, uh, mosques, you know, everybody, they're doing their own things, you know, no fighting with each other. The reasons why things came to a head here on Saturday night are complicated. We've spoken to lots of people in this city in recent days and they've cited everything from disinformation on social media to tensions in Indian politics playing out on the streets of Leicester. There have also been concerns about people from other cities coming to Leicester to fan the flames of conflict. Today, Hindu and Muslim leaders appealed for calm outside a local mosque, delivering a statement on behalf of both communities. We together call upon the immediate cessation of provocation and violence, both in thought and behavior. Meanwhile, the police have faced criticism for not being better prepared for Saturday's disorder. Were you caught on the hop on Saturday night? Looking at what we knew, what we were facing, and the declining threat at that time, I think we had the right resource for what we knew at that time. And I suspect these arrests will go on for several weeks, if not months, in relation to this. Uh, so I'm anticipating we're in this for the medium to long haul to see this all the way through. Dozens have already been arrested over the past few weeks, some of them from outside the city. And a 20-year-old man has been sent to prison for 10 months in connection with the unrest on Saturday. But the fear and concern following recent events here will take time to address. Naftej Johal, BBC News, Leicester. The time is just after quarter past six, our top story this evening. Liz Truss says she is prepared to be an unpopular Prime Minister to help the economy grow. And England play cricket in Pakistan for the first time in 17 years. Coming up on Sports Day on the BBC News Channel with exactly two months to go until the start of the Football World Cup in Qatar. We'll look at how the home nations are warming up. Health officials in Pakistan say they've seen a sharp increase in diseases like malaria and dengue fever in Pakistan after the devastating floods which saw a third of the country submerged. The head of the World Health Organization has warned the rapidly rising numbers could become a second disaster. More than 1,500 people lost their lives in the floods and 33 million people have been directly affected. Our South Asia correspondent Rajini Vaidnathan has been to Thaka in Sindh province where families are in desperate need of aid. Just a warning, this report contains upsetting images from the start. Already in pain, Pakistan's living through a never-ending nightmare. Ten-month-old Saeed lost his home in the floods. Now he's fighting for his life. As his mother Noor watches on, 
doctors give him an urgent blood transfusion. He's suffering from a severe case of malaria. We're really poor. I'm worried for my child. I feel helpless that I can't do more for him. Our homes were flooded. Since then, everyone seems to be getting malaria. Including two-year-old Saima, who we meet in the next bed along. Her grandfather, Gulam, brought her to hospital from his submerged village far away. You can see I'm really worried. We are struggling to get proper treatment. She's had diarrhea and she has a fever all over her body. Almost everyone on this ward has fled from the floods. And almost every patient here is young. And this, uh, this child, uh, with this patient, this is five years old female child. As Dr. Ashfaq explains, living in the open has left thousands even more vulnerable displaced and in distress. And because of this surrounding water, there are so many mosquitoes. Not only this malaria, but they are spreading dengue as well. We have too much burden now of this malaria cases. But now we have malaria treatment only for three days. Pakistan's healthcare system is struggling to cope with an influx of waterborne diseases. A country already ravaged by the floods is now facing a medical emergency. And even when these patients recover, Many don't have a home to go to. Not far from the hospital, large swathes of this province remain underwater. Rural Sindh is the worst affected area and one of Pakistan's poorest. Hundreds of thousands have set up shelter on this riverbank. Families who came here seeking sanctuary, now struggling to stay alive. The risk of disease the latest burden to those who've already been left with nothing. Virginia Vardinavan, BBC News, Sindh Province. Now a look at some other stories making the news today. Performance on waiting time targets at Scotland's hospital A&E units has hit a new low. The most recent figures showed just 63.5% of patients were dealt with within four hours. The Scottish Government's target is 95%. Scotland's Health Secretary said the figures were not acceptable. The parents of Madeleine McCann, who vanished from a holiday resort in the Algarve in 2007, have lost the latest stage of a legal battle in their libel action over claims made by a Portuguese police detective. Kate and Jerry McCann appealed to the European Court of Human Rights about the Portuguese court's judgment. Goncalo Amaral alleged in a book that they were involved in the disappearance of their daughter. The government in Wales is pressing ahead with delayed plans to ban single-use carrier bags and plastic drinking straws. England and Scotland have already banned plastic straws, cotton buds and stirrers, though nowhere in the UK has stopped the sale of single-use carrier bags. Around 28 million people were watching on television as the procession carrying the Queen's coffin passed through Parliament Square after the service at Westminster Abbey yesterday. That was the peak television audience, but huge audiences continued watching throughout the day, the vast majority on the BBC. Today, flags on British government buildings around the world are back at full mast at the end of the official period of national mourning. Our Royal Correspondent Daniela Ralph reports. After the public mourning of the past 12 days, the King has returned to Scotland, arriving at Aberdeen Airport and heading to Balmoral. The Royal Estate where his mother died. In the peace and beauty of Deeside, he will escape the glare of the last week. He will be working here, viewing government papers and taking phone calls of condolence. Across the UK, flags are now returning to full mast, as national mourning is now over, and the country adjusts to life with a new head of state. The grandeur and precision of yesterday's funeral was an intense experience for those directly involved. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel James Shaw, in the bearskin in the centre of the screen here, led the gun carriage procession. The significance of what he did is only now sinking in. It was the proudest moment of my life. 
the most important duty of my military career. Elated to have been part of something so big, but also very emotional. I think we all hadn't had much time to reflect on Her Majesty's passing, and I know I felt very sad last night reflecting for the first time. And still, the people and the flowers keep coming. On the long walk in Windsor, the crowds may be smaller, but the feelings of loss remain strong for some. It's just so peaceful. It's completely different <laughs> than all the crowds and everything emptiness, yesterday. A whole emptiness. <laughs> it's not normal. It's just we're all in limbo. Sorry. Yesterday was just so amazing and a beautiful service. It was an absolute fitting farewell, wasn't it? But uh, yeah, it's a sense of bereavement in a in a strange sort of way. And at Buckingham Palace too, there has been a steady stream of tributes throughout the day. The royal family is still in a period of mourning for the next week. They won't be carrying out any official engagements. When the king returns here to Buckingham Palace, the focus will be on his autumn schedule and it will include his first international tour as monarch. At the end of the funeral day, the royal family released this photo of the Queen from the early 70s. She was at Balmoral, where her son now privately grieves. Daniela Ralph, BBC News. Our media and arts correspondent David Sillito is with me now. Let's talk about those television viewing figures. They're just the ones for the United Kingdom. Uh, they were huge. I don't think anyone will be that surprised, though, will they? Absolutely extraordinary. Let's just choose one moment. 12.25, the funeral procession is going through Parliament Square, heading towards Whitehall. 19.5 million people are watching on BBC One alone. Then you've got 50 plus other channels in the UK, all showing it. And add it together, it's about 28 million. But what I think is even more extraordinary is that from 10 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock in the evening, the figures on BBC One alone never go below 10, 11 million. So if you think of all the people, number of people who dipped in and dipped out through the day, that 28 million is just the beginning. There are going to be so many more there. But if you just think about it, at 12.25, 28.6 million people were watching TV altogether. That means more than 95% of the TV audience was watching the same thing at the same time. It almost never happens. A true landmark moment. David Zillito, thank you. For the first time in a cricketing generation, England are playing a game in Pakistan. Their 17-year absence from the country has been based on security concerns. Some in cricket feared they'd never return. So the start of the T20 series in Karachi has been warmly welcomed. The match is well underway and Joe Wilson is there. The love of cricket prevails in Pakistan. It's the great distraction and entertainment through troubled times. In a Karachi park, matches overlap and intertwine, while at the National Stadium, they wait. The plans, the protection for England to finally play here again. In 2009, a bus carrying Sri Lankan cricketers came under attack elsewhere in Pakistan. Here in Karachi, this is the security convoy which escorts the players of Pakistan and England from their hotel to the stadium every time. And all of this so that cricket matches can be played. Pakistan's players wore special shirts. On the back, the numbers are half submerged to symbolize floods, to express solidarity. Then the captain gave the crowd a reason to cheer. Baba Azam, few in the world bat better. Although maybe Mohammed Rizwan does. There are so many talented players, but Pakistani cricket needs teams to tour here. And a sense of gratitude spans from fans to the coach. All the boys, all the players, you know, they have a very uh, uh, strong and long relation with each other. And the cricket, uh, I always say that, you know, it's, it brings the people, the communities, the countries close to each other. But make no mistake, the job is to compete. That's England's captain, Moeen Ali, dispatched for six as Pakistan built their total. But England had their moments too. Bowling! That's new boy Luke Wood. 159 for England to win. Here's an old boy back in the team. Alex Hales batting after three years when he didn't fit in. 
Phil Salt is building his international career. Admire the shot until you see the catch. Admire that even more. Held right on the edge. Tight situation, tight game. But as England continued their chase, the connection lost for a cricket generation had been remade. And that's the true value of this match. Joe Wilson, BBC News, Karachi. Time now for a look at the weather. Matt Taylor is here and you've got some dramatic weather there. Where's that? I have indeed quite here, but this is the other side of the Atlantic at the moment. Uh, Sophie, Hurricane Fiona has been affecting the Caribbean. The first major hurricane of the season has been devastating Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic. It is now a Category 3 storm with winds over 130 miles an hour swirling around to the east of the Turks and Caicos. That is set to move its way northwards. Could get very close to Bermuda having an effect there. But what is noticeable about this, it could still be a hurricane when it reaches eastern Canada later this week before heading with unusually warm air towards the Arctic. Now back to our shores, as I said, things have been quieter, but also cooler. Things are about to change. These weather fronts approaching, southwesterly winds picking up. So tonight to north and west, those winds start to gather. It's going to be a much milder night. Uh, temperatures around uh, 11 to 14 degrees. Coldest towards the south of England, 6 Celsius. But there could be a few mist and fog patches tomorrow morning. But this area cloud here, this is the warm front. That's going to gradually introduce mild air further southwards through the day. Most places will be dry. There will be a few showers dotted around across southern Scotland, northern England, potentially maybe also the Isle of Man. Uh, after a sunny start for many, cloud will build up. But actually, it's going to feel a bit warmer tomorrow. You'll notice, though, the biggest change is to the north and west of Scotland. We'll see some outbreaks of rain come and go through the day. And it's here where we're going to see the wind really pick up. Could see it touch gale force by the end of tomorrow afternoon. And if I take you into tomorrow evening and tomorrow night, notice how rain starts to develop more widely across Scotland, Northern Ireland, pushing southwards towards the Isle of Man and potentially also Cumbria. Clearer skies later in the night. Further south, though, much of England Wales, dry night, few mist and fog patches around, milder start to Thursday morning, good dry day with some sunny spells for many, but outbreaks of rain, clearing away from northern west of Scotland, Northern Ireland, so brightening up here, not a great day if you're after, not after some rain, southern Scotland, northern England, particularly northwest, northern west Wales, outbreaks of rain coming and going. Chillier to the south, to north, milder to the south, that cooler air pushes its way southwards, end of the week. Sophie. Matt, thank you. And that's it from the BBC News at six. The news continues here on BBC One. It's time to join our colleagues across the nations and regions for the news where you are. Good night.